Is this microphone? <coughs> this one. Okay. Uh, can you can you hear me? Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and thanks to my friends, uh, Margaret Asimira and others. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back and reconnect um, with what's going on here and sharing thoughts and and learning from also what's going on here. <coughs> Australia is very important to, it's been important in my life, it shaped me, but uh, not just by autobiographically or biographically, but also intellectually. And my climate work comes out of, more out of my Australian experience, um, of the drought of the beginning of this century, than uh, my Indian experience. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to talk about tonight is... Um, um, something that pertains to how we look on this moment in history um, when um, anybody who thinks about climate change and what it means becomes more aware of uh, geological facts about this planet and at the same time, if I might say so, they remain unaware that they are becoming more aware of this geological fact. So there's a funny way in which um, facts of deep history are always with us. Um, for instance, uh, there's not no object in this room that doesn't actually take for granted that humans have opposable thumbs. Now that's an evolutionary fact. We just live with it, live around it, live with the help of it. We don't stop to think about it. Uh, normally that's our relationship with deep history, that we don't stop to think about it. And because we have the habit of not stopping to think about deep history, we don't stop to think about it even when deep history stares us in the face uh, and actually um, speaks to us in our own language. And there's a peculiar forgetting of the large scale that happens even in discussions of climate change. Uh, and uh, really the question I'm asking tonight is what happens if we uh, resist the forgetting and remember uh, that those aspects of deep history that come towards us. So just to give you an example, um, to frame the talk, so one of the first things I did here after getting here this time was, uh, uh, was speak to a class that Asi, my friend Asi was teaching. It's an MA class. Most students are from the Far East some islanders as last last year, and most of them doing economics. They have heard something about climate change. And I asked them uh, this question that uh, when we say that there is excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what does the word excess mean? What is it, I mean, why is, it, why is the word excess used? I mean, it excess in relationship to what? And um, of course, they don't know, and I don't, blame, I don't blame them for not knowing. People just know. So when I said, okay, excess means uh, that part of carbon dioxide, or greenhouse gases, but carbon dioxide that we can't recycle. I mean, that's what excess is. I mean, so then I explained to them that in the normal course of things, carbon dioxide emitted by the planet or us gets absorbed by the planet by forests, by soil, by sea, um, and it's really what it cannot absorb. It, that's, that's the part of carbon dioxide that constitutes excess. And they agreed. But I said, do you know that if you gave the planet a million years, it would absorb it all? And uh, because the planet has a million year old carbon cycle. And then so I, real, I told them that it's only excessive from a human point of view. The planet doesn't work, work as fast as we would like it to. So it's really, if we could sort of get the planet to accelerate its processes, to pace them up, then we will say, look, just absorb in 20 years what you normally would absorb in a million years. It's just too slow for us. And, and then they realized that when we say excess carbon dioxide, what we mean is that the normal scale of time which we use in our calculations to do human things, that sort of sense of time and that scale of time are now brushing up 
against much larger scales of time. So the word excess is a peculiar word through which what the planet does, the speed at which the planet does it, kind of um, comes to us and yet we don't see it because we don't think through the word excess. Similarly, when we say fossil fuel is not renewable, and so we say we talk about going over to non-renewable, so renewables, that fossil fuel is non-renewable. But if you could have the patience to wait around for 300 million years, the planet would make fossil fuels again. Fossil fuels are perfectly renewable on a planetary scale. They're non-renewable on a human scale. So when you think of climate change as a problem, even the way we discuss it, there are all these words that are like that have this double function, almost contradictory function. They kind of at once reveal what you might consider the planetary to us. But then in the way that we don't think about it, they at the same time cover it up. So philosophically, it's like what German philosopher Heidegger used to say, that the question of being, questions of existence, is something that, is something that we, that it's come up into our view flittingly. We see it, and then we get so absorbed in our particular life that we don't see it. So, so, but the interesting thing is that because climate change is a problem that happens on a very large scale, this is now constantly happening for anybody thinking about climate change. So, the, and in fact, it is a, so I'll quickly show you some slides. The, the very problem of planetary climate change, the very problem of knowing that the question of knowing that there is a planetary climate system uh, wouldn't have been possible before the Second World War, uh, big time, without the kind of space technology, satellite sort of measurements, sensors in the sea, all kinds of equipments and technologies that became possible after the Second World War. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to formulate what climate change is. And so let, just to quickly um, take you through some slides um, <clears throat> to get you up to a point where I want to, so I'm really trying to introduce my propositions for this evening by talking about a paper that I'm not presenting. These slides belong to another paper, <laughs> but, but I just thought they would help to give you a background and they're not organized for the purpose of um, this presentation. Now, am I doing something? I must be doing, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so basically, we are talking about two kinds. At, at the moment, we are talking about two kinds of world, or the globe. One is the globe of globalization. So, um, and that's what we've been talking about for the last 30, 40 years, which is, in history, in, in, in terms of historians, we call it world history, how the world got connected, how it came together, the rise of European empires. This is roughly a 500-year-old history, if you, are, if you speak in terms of European imperialism. If you're interested in human civilization, it might be at the most a 6,000-year-old 6, history. Uh, but the, the globe of global warming comes out of Cold War science, uh, concerns of, about the Cold War, and eventually resulted is it the particular climate science eventually comes out of a very young science called earth system science. And these days often geology is described as earth system science. Um, the first time a body was set up to study earth system, that is the planet as a sort of geobiological system was 1983, NASA set up a subcommittee to study the planet as a system. Um, so you can see how young this is. And so when you talk about globalization, Humans are the protagonists of global history, and re we are really sort of looking at our own society's histories from the bottom up. Looking at the planet as a whole belongs to a whole history, not the history of humans wanting to look at the planet as a whole. Now, that itself is an old history. There's a Yale uh, uh, academic called Ayesha Ramachandran, who has written a very interesting book on human imaginations of the planet as a whole in the early modern period. Um, one example of imagining viewing the planet 
uh, from outside, for instance, his marketer's plan, the maps we use, which of course was, I mean, those, that, those, that vision of the planet also was accompanied by the idea that if you actually look, look at the world uh, from, it, from outside, what you will see is harmony, because it's God's work. So you'll see design, harmony, things set in a particular order. Uh, the Roman Emperor Scipio had the famous Scipio's dream, which is in his dream he floats up and looks at the world. So you, you could say that when the astronauts went up and looked at this planet, they were not imagining this planet from outside for the first time in human history. So there's a, there's a human history of imagining this planet being looked at from outside. But the distinction is that while most of these histories are actually looking at the planet with ordinary human eyes, so the, looking at the planet as the planet might seem. Uh, you'll all remember the, the, blue, the blue marble photograph. That's what the planet looks like to human eyes. But what has also happened with NASA and space science is that there's, there's another way of looking at the planet from outside where the planet is actually reconstituted analytically. So you find out abstract information about the planetary system you find out abstract information about other planets and you reconstitute it scientifically. In other words, you ask the question not how does it look, but you ask how does it work. So, so for instance, there you ask questions like what has allowed this planet to maintain oxygen at 21% of the atmosphere roughly for about 600 million years? Because if oxygen went up, everything would go up in flames. If it went down, we will all choke to death. And it's funny for the planet has been able to do this. So when you ask these sorts of questions, how does the planet function? That those kind of questions um, taking particular shape in Carl Sagan's explorations of the space in James Lovelock Gaia theory eventually mutated into what is now called Earth system sciences, where they now understand this Earth system only to only sort of being systemic in a very precarious way. In other words, the, if you look at the history of the planet, it's gone through very jerky movements, gone from one phase to another phase. We don't know why the transitions happen. You know, one of the most interesting things I find as a social science historian of the lefty kind is that uh, my Marxist friends, including myself when I was a Marxist, uh, we'd look at 200 years and feel absolutely certain about that we know the causes of why something happens. And when you look at this 4 billion, more than 4 billion year old planet, things are so random that you realize that randomness actually has a much more important role in a lot of natural history uh, than, the, than the kind of hostility uh, that is warranted by the hostility that we express towards randomness while explaining social history. But you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that, that point. Um, so quickly to go through this slide. So let me, um, as I said, I'm, I apologize. The slides were not made, meant for this talk. So I'll just quickly. Um, Go to, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> going to some geological slides <laughs> to give you an. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one I wanted. So if you look at this slide, that shows you the jerky history of the planet. So the first slide, the first top um, picture is of the whole four billion years, the history of the planet from the beginning. And basically, it takes a slice and then expands it. So the next, next one is 500 million years, 60 million years, and last 3 million, 60,000 um, years. And then um, that's the kind of slice that geologists produce to show the connection between geology and biology. Um, and um, the, let me just. And, uh, so these are basically what happens is that um, in different phases, for instance, the planet shows different kind of systemic behaviors. So again, if I go back to this, this size, the second one, so that's 500 million years, you begin, the planet begin to show a certain cycle when there are phases when the planet has no ice caps, no ice. And that's often called the hothouse state of the planet. And then phases when the planet has ice caps, they're called the ice house state of the, of the planet. So even though we are experiencing global warming, it's happening in an ice house state of the planet. Now, again, there's no explaining why 
the planet does these things, but what they realize is that these changes are connected. So in other words, you could say that the planetary history is one of different emerging levels of complexity. You know, just as, in other words, if you add a level of complexity, life becomes more complex, or human becomes more populous, the planet then has to add something to its complex functioning, to make the functioning more complex. Just as if the university ex expands its administrators, which it often does, <laughs> and that's the expansion that often happens, um, you know, then the administrators will actually add layers of complexity to the university, <laughs> partly to justify their existence. So, there's, so basically, there's a, the history of the planet is like emergent layers of complexities. Uh, and, from, and the move from one layer of complexity to another is often jerky. And why the planet changes, but they see that the emergent of complex cellular life, multicellular life, changes the nature of the planet. And from that, they argue that there is a kind of a planetary system which, which eventually works to keep temperature oxygen at a certain point. Within that, there are glacial ice ages and interglacials. We are an interglacial. And of course, now the... the <clears throat> so this, this gives rise to... Now I'm sort of entering my, my today's conversation. <clears throat> I'll, try, I'll try to speak for another 40 minutes and bring it to an end. Um, <clears throat> so what happens is it's in this context that um, they began to argue that <clears throat> thanks to greenhouse gas emissions, hum humans have now become a geophysical force. Why a geophysical force? Because the kind of force that you need to create the cycle of ice ages and interglacials, which is forces created by wobbles in the planet's orbit, often called Milankovitch cycles, that kind of geophysical force is now being exerted by humans, human beings or our civilization because they argue we have fended off the next ice age. So we have broken away maybe from the glacial interglacial cycle and put the planet on a different trajectory in its own history. So the word Anthropocene, which is my subject this evening, was coined to signal this transition, to bring it into popular consciousness. And uh, as you know, the word was um, the word actually goes back to 1926 to a Soviet scientist, Alexei Pavlov, who coined it, and was immediately popularized by another Soviet scientist called Vladimir Varnetsky. But the interesting thing about the word is from that from 1926 to its recent revival by Paul Crutzen and others, is that even though the word Anthropocene refers to the name of a geological epoch. And epochs are measured in tens of millions of years. So it refers to a certain kind of sense of geological time. And, you know, most geological history is in the past. I mean, what we have, the planet is an archive. So what we have are relics of the past, right? Um, so it refers to time. But instead, the word entered popular imagination as a measure of the human impact on the planet. So the moment you... Think of Anthropocene as a measure of human impact on the planet. The question of human impact cannot ever be separated from the moral point or the question about whether or not we should have an impact on such a scale. So if you don't think of time, so again, the very word Anthropocene is another word where geological time shows itself and then vanishes. Because we, instead of asking questions about geological time, we say this word signals the, the extent of the impact. Look, we are now able to shift this planet to another geological period. So much is our impact. Now, which means that Anthropocene, as a word signaling the scale or a measure, even if we can't quantify it immediately, of human impact on the planet is always, by definition, a scientific and a moral word. Because as I said, there's no discussion of it that emerges from, um, that se separates itself from the moral concerns. And that's also very understandable in scientific terms because the same technology and equipments that allow you to measure human impact also allows you to measure the deleterious nature of that impact. Right? So, and because the word has been moral, 
social scientists have picked it up. It is the first word ever in the history of geological periods that's been debated by so many humanists with absolutely no training in stratigraphy. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing feature that people with no sense of what geology is, some do but most don't, have been arguing bitterly with scientists as to from when it should be calculated, when should, when should we say it started. So some of the scientists said, okay, maybe it starts from the 1950s with the detonation of the <coughs> first uh, bomb, atom bomb. Um, and there have been vigorous uh, uh, argument against it. Some people saying it's actually not Anthropocene because not all humans did it. Only some humans, rich humans, rich nations did it. Um, therefore, it should be called Capitalocene. <laughs> it, it should be called Econocene. It should be called Plantationocene. Uh, Donna Haraway comes up with something that I can't even pronounce. Um, but, but, uh, but all sinful scenes. Are, are named uh, as, as in contestation, as a result of which Jan Zalasiewicz, who is a stratigrapher, who actually heads up the working group that's been set up to eventually make a submission to formalize this term, recently came out with a fascinating article where he was arguing that, look, um, if you basically he was saying if you think of Anthropocene, as a measure of human impact, we will never be able to settle on actually its definition of when it started. So there's an Australian uh, geologist, Andrew Glickson, who argues that it starts with the invention of fire by hominids. So because fire was invented because homo, before homo sapiens uh, emerged by hominids. So he says that that was the first time actually a biological species had at its disposal more energy, with the, with, thanks to fire, than its muscles could produce. And so he, then therefore you could create more entropy. So his argument is we should date Anthropocene back to the, the uh, hominid control of fire. Some people take it back to megafauna extinction. Now these are, or some people take it back to agriculture. Now these are people who are not very interested in debating capitalism. People who are interested in debating capitalism don't want to go beyond 500 years because then you can't blame it on capitalism. <laughs> and uh, so they want to argue with European expansion in Southern America. 1610 is one date favored. Uh, uh, and people who are archaeologists, in fact, one of my colleagues now gone to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Kathleen Morrison, kind of wrote an article against me, but partly using my words to hoist me on my own petard, as it were. Um, called Provincializing the Anthropocene. And, uh, and, uh, and she was arguing that, uh, that to say that in European uh, industrial nations caused it, it to make it, make it Eurocentric, we should look at you know, cultivation of rice, cultivation of wheat, uh, many different places. So archaeological evidence must do it. And that, um, <coughs> now, Zalasovich then eventually argues in this recent article called uh, The Anthropocene, uh, an exciting strata or something, he argues that, look, if the word has to be formalized, uh, then having so many different stories, and all of those stories rising on political arguments, basically, won't work. I mean, then they'll say a politically uh, kind of guided term would not be acceptable to the International Geological Union. Now, there are many geologists who actually argue, let's not formalize it. Andrew Blixen actually says, let's keep it an informal term, like um, um, ice house earth or hot house earth. These are informal terms, never formalized, but respectable and accepted by geologists. But if you want to formalize it, Zalasovich argues, then the real question is not who caused it. Uh, the real question is, is there enough evidence in the strata of the planet to suggest that we have exited the threshold of what defined the previous geological epoch, the Holocene, uh, which, in, which is sort of roughly kind of equates with the invention of agriculture, but basically the ending of the Ice Ages and the new epoch. Um, he actually says that 
we would have had a much easier time dealing with this term if if it were the case it, that humans had nothing to do with if rats had caused it if somehow this was then we wouldn't be caught up in arguments about capitalism megafauna extinction because the moral aspect of it wouldn't be there and this is you know shila jasnov at harvard actually says that many scientific and technical words come into public life as moral as moral problems and that's why we debate them so long as they're not moral problems we leave them to the scientists so zalasevich argues that the real thing to work out is whether or not there's enough evidence in the strata to say that one can logically argue that we are not in the holocene anymore because the because normally in geology you first look for evidence like in any rational science you first look for evidence then name the problem but here the problem was reversed paul crutzen in anger said anthropocene the term caught on and now you're going around looking for data to shore up the term so it's like you know that pirandello plays six characters in search of a playwright uh, and is it because this process was reversed there's this problem but he also says that if you don't if you don't forget who caused it <coughs> if you don't forget that it's, it's it's a measure of impact you will never see the passage of geological time so having so therefore he actually then goes on to say that that we need anthropocene needs a particular kind of thinking which he says should not be human centered but should be planet centered form of thinking having taken you this far i'm going to read from the paper uh, not not everything but actually at least most of it <laughs> uh, most of my the the last sections of the paper so the last of it says so let me begin from here the quest for the anthro quest for stratigraphic records proper to the anthropocene is centered on the question of whether or not it would it could be argued that there is enough evidence in the lithosphere and on the surface of the planet to support the proposition that the planet has exited the threshold of the holocene epoch the critical question for the stratigraphers are not how globally important in human terms the new boundary is or when was the first um sign of influence of some major new factor in the earth system a question that understandably concerned many who debated the moral aspect of the idea as alas which puts it the in terms of the definition of a stratigraphic anthropocene what is at issue is the change to the earth system rather than a change to the extent to which we are recognizing human influence and he goes on to say that name anthropocene carries no special literal or human significance for stratigraphers Incidentally most geological names are trivial they come from trivial origins they don't signify anything so the name cretaceous for instance is from the latin word for chalk jurassic after the jura hills on the franco swiss border triassic because across much of central europe it had a tripartite character two sandstone formations separated by distinctive limestone silurian from the name of an ancient british tribe cambrian after the roman name for wales denovian after the english country devonshire so you can see the geological terms he is saying they don't mean anything so don't take anthropocene literally if you don't take it literally and don't think that we are measuring human impact you will see the point of stratigraphers that we've exited the holocene and then you will see what geological force is and time is now here i should quickly summarize what i say in the early part of the paper that for people who want to make it into a story of um, so what's happening in the debate in, anth in about anthropocene um, just bear with me i have to go back slide by slide back to my old um, okay let me just stay with this slide so basically people who are debating that geologist use of the term anthropocene and saying and taking exception to the word anthropos and saying it's class it's what they're trying to do is to fold into 500 years of human history world history right sort of the con the, the, con the reconstitution of the planet that's happening on this side from the view from outside the planet the planet being the planetary histories and what a particular translation that they do otherwise you can't answer the moral question which is that they translate the geological word force humanity has become a geophysical force that word force is newtonian 
It literally means the kind of pull that one body exerts on another body. They translate that into sociological existential category of power. And that's why they can say that what has caused humanity to be this force is actually the power that rich people exercise. Right? And that translation, I will argue, has all the problems of translation that we normally see. And um, so what they, so they don't deny the geological, but they're actually trying to say, well, the geological will actually work if it matters to us. And they have a point, you know, at the end of the day, we are all individual human beings. What we do with climate change will depend on a lot of decisions we individually make. Which is why often, I mean, I go and give this talk, and I was giving a version of this talk in Sydney, and people said to me, before my talk, a couple of people said to me and said, Deepesh, we don't want any more pessimism. <laughs> now, pessimism and optimism are precisely two emotions that relate to human time scale. Because they come out of the question, what can we do about it? And these people therefore argue that if you think in geological terms, geological things don't lend themselves to policy. They don't lend themselves to politics. So what do you do with that when actually the geological is staring back at you? We are not. So what I would argue that there's something that I called on Holocene assumption. I would argue that you dwell psychologically in the world of the Holocene as if you are living before we knew anything about climate change, to the degree that you take deep histories for granted. Like, as I give you an example, the opposable thumb. In other words, these things you know, but they don't matter. As if that happened to somebody else. Uh, so to the degree that I think of my pension funds, and I don't think of climate change, I actually live, I dwell in the Holocene. I don't dwell in the Anthropocene. So there are actually effects which are appropriate to the Holocene affect, but which, when you transfer them to the question of Anthropocene, because it's so large scale, and seems and we seem we feel outscaled by it, becomes questions of pessimism and optimism, or despair, or people will say, what can we do about, you know, can we do something, and that results from the translation. I'll come back to the question of translation, but Zalasevich ends his article saying that from the stratigraphic perspective, the Anthropocene is seen as a planet-centered rather than a human-centered phenomenon. And that's why he actually disagrees that we should not think that, we should think of Anthropocene in, as archaeological labels for age, like Bronze, Bronze Age, Stone Age, because they all refer back to human activities. So he's saying, if you want to see geological time, you have to train yourself into thinking that this, almost think that this almost has nothing to do with humans. Even though he says it so happens that it's our activities that has caused our, us to exit the Holocene. So the last part, the, 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 before the last part, so let me then stay a little more with this distinction between um, planet-centered and human-centered forms of thought. David Archer, my, geo, my geophysics colleague, actually writes a book on climate change where he says that however impatient we get with the slow nature of Earth cycles, the carbon cycle, the glacial cycles, the planet will take its own time. We can't hurry it along. And therefore, therefore as, there are aspects to the climate problem that are simply not amenable to solutions on human timescales. And there are aspects that are. Um, so it's like sort of facing cancer, you know, like you, you know that certain things you can't do anything about, but that doesn't stop you from doing things you can do about it. Um, geological time is not identical to absolute mathematical time. There remains a material si side of time for geologists, for there is no geological time without there being geological objects. Ultimately, for the purpose of our discussion, this time is written into the strata of the planet. And it is indeed these strata, strata with their fly ash, microplastics, supermarket chicken bones, and so on, that form the core of the argument for the stratigraphic Anthropocene. But however we think of geological time, and the, the, the argument I'm making is that human beings, when you, human beings actually have, always think of time with affect. Now, this is a point that was made beautifully by the German philosopher of history, Reinhard Koselleck, 
when he says that when we think through world history, historical time, which is human historical time, our time is always produced through the movement of two lines. One he calls, we are always caught between these two lines, as it were. One he calls the space of experience. The other one is the horizon of expectation. So human affect over time is cr created out of this. And that's what causes despair, uh, hope. They all come from this tension between what we experience and what our horizon of expectation is. Geological time, that is very large scale time, which, of which humans have been aware for a very long time, doesn't produce that kind of effect. Because as I said, we think of evolution having happened, not really concerned with my uh, lifetime, except uh, marginally. But my point is that this, however we think of geological time, and over a long number of years, Christian theology, that is the very thought of looking at uh, the nature, as uh, geology as the book of nature, uh, 17th, 18th century, Astronomy, physics, evolutionary biology, and other areas of thought have contributed to its history. Geological time belongs, it belongs to a class of time that has always been seen, long before geology, as opposed to the sense or scale of temporality of human history. St. Augustine saw this kind of time as expressed in numbers to which he said we cannot give a name. Buffon thought of it as time that, I'm quoting, did not conform to the limited powers of our intelligence. So these are all statements about affect, right? These are about how humans feel confronted with this sense of huge uh, expanse of time. Darwin described its vastness as incomprehensible. Self-described geologists in the early 19th century came to accept it as something that was literally beyond human imagination, even if no quantitative figures could yet be attached to it. All these descriptions you will see do not speak of empty time. So they actually speak of human affect. They actually speak of how human beings comport themselves when they're faced with this whole question of deep time. Shown as such of human affect, Augustine, Buffo, Darwin, all speak of this time only in relationship to being human, thus marking it as representing a limit to the time of historicality that is a, as a limit, as a temporal place where meaning making, the tension between the horizon of expectation and the space of experience ceases to work. Right? So you are actually facing a sense of time where human meaning making ceases to work. Which means that the narrative of world history has now collided in our thoughts with the much longer term geological history of the planet, of the, that is of the Earth system. And so you can, now if I go back to the theme of translation before I get to the very last section of this, so you can see what's happening with it. What's happening with the translation when you convert geological force into social power or human existence. Now, I say the human conception of power is both sociological and existential, not in an arbitrary way. If you read Stephen Lukes, the old sociologist who wrote a book called Power, you will see that he thinks of power in the way we think of power. Power is like a thing or a, or a liquid. Somebody has more of it, somebody has less of it. Uh, somebody can get more of it. Uh, you can empower. Uh, you can give people more power. You can share power, all of the power sharing arrangements. If you read Foucault, and particularly the first volume of History of Sexuality, the chapter called Methods, you will find that Foucault actually engages in a very nominalist exercise about power where he defines power by what power is not. This power is not this, power is not that, power is not that. He doesn't have a positive definition of power. Because for him, power is an existential. There can't be human beings without power. Power it describes something about human existence. So power is both sociological and existential. But what happens is, in the earth, in, on this side, where people develop earth system science, what they're looking at is something that they see as a planetary system, earth system. You know, Will Steffen once said uh, in a lecture in Australia that when we said the, ri the, ri the rise in temperature should not go beyond two degrees, it was earth system science speaking policy. But you know, if earth system could hear if you could imagine a system with ears, 
Then Will Stefan and his likes, the Earth System Science people, would have loved to tell that system itself, just calm down and bring the temperature down, don't go above two degrees. Because humans are part of the Earth system, they are not the Earth system itself. In a Latourian sense, you can say that in the Earth system, all you're speaking to seeing is an it with distributed agency. But when my anti-capitalist friends and Marxist friends say, um, it's capital scene, some people caused it, what do they do? They place in the place of the it, an I, a subject called a class, nation, or even people who say humans should take responsibility and become stewards of the planet. They're all, from different points of view, replacing the it by an, in German, and I'll deliberately use the German word, ish, I. Why? Because as Lacan said, talking about such displacement, reworking Freud, as Lacan said, you would remember, he says, where it was, ish comes to be. Right? So there's a deep display. The second display is, again, in Lacanian terms, you can say that the, uh, if you took the Earth system's view of us, then you see us as part of Earth systems, but people who actually want either humans to take stewardship of the planet or want capitalist or capitalist system to take the blame for it, there is again this displacement. It's like in Lacanian terms, Lacan says, you know, it's as if the Earth system is saying to you, to humans, I don't see you from where you see me. Now, these displacements, when these displacements are happening, um, and just very quickly, to give you the difference, in the world, in world history perspective, the story is told from human points of view. Humans are its protagonists. Read any world history book. The story of modernity is roughly 500 years from European expansion and imperialism. The main thing driving it is identity and difference. Um, so questions of racism, slavery, uh, the main kind of politics eventually the expansion, the, the last chapter of identity and difference would be bios and biopolitics. On the right hand side I've put the word zoe. So bios refers in Aristotle according to Agamben, good life in the city. Zoe refers to natural reproductive life, any kind of life. So for people who are looking at the earth from the outside, their look in geology and biology is very non-anthropocentric. You can't tell the story of life making humans central. We come so late, and we are such Johnny come late leaders, um, that, that they basically tell a non-anthropocentric story. And the most interesting thing is that when you read cl about climate change, you find there's a con deep conflict of human values going on. There's one set of people who think that the most miraculous thing to have happened in the story of creation are humans. And therefore humans have to be saved at all costs. And there are others, they're also humans, Andrew Glickson is one of them, who actually think that the most miraculous thing that has happened is the emergence of life, and especially complex life. So from Lovelock on to Glickson, to Wally Broker, John Langmuir's Earth History, a beautiful book called To Build a Habitable Planet. Their main concern is that if humans carry on with the business as usual, we will not only, we will actually leave this planet, not only lead it to another extinction in two, three hundred years or three hundred to six hundred years, but actually leave the planet less, with less, much less rich with biodiversity. So the story is that after every great extinction, biodiversity increased on the planet. And their fear is that, that the wreckage is so much that if we have the sixth great extinction, the planet might regress back to an earlier stage in the history of life on the planet. And they have a word for it. They call it planeticide. So Andrew Glickson and, and a new, I forget his name now, um, we'll come to the name. Uh, they have written a book together where they coined this word planeticide. And they said, humans have no understanding that they're actually committing, the, committing this sin of planeticide. It's a debate between humans, but you can see, depending on your perspective, for humans, the question is sustainability. This is a deeply human-centric term. You know, the word sustainability, one of the areas where it was introduced early in the 20th century was fishery. 
and there's a Canadian uh, uh, biologist dead now. There's a very, you know, scientific articles are not funny usually, but he has a funny article on the history of the word sustainability in his field, which is fishery. So when it was introduced in North America, the idea was that every species had a harvestable surplus. And you could, they developed a formula in North, North Americans by which you could calculate the harvestable surplus of any species. And the idea was that you would only fish the harvestable surplus. The whole question of Canadian regulations, how do you make sure that companies follow that, blah, blah, blah. But you just have to think about it. That the concept that every species has a harvestable surplus can only be had by a species that regards itself as having no harvestable surplus. <laughs> right? If tigers were in charge, I'm sure humans would look like they had a wonderful amount of harvestable surplus. <laughs> so this is a deeply anthropocentric concept, sustainability. For these guys on this side, the critical question is habitability. Their question is what makes a planet habitable by complex life? And this has actually given rise in physics to a new sub-discipline uh, called astrobiology. And these are the people who talk about exoplanets, the Drake equation, and all of that stuff. And they're, they're, at the center of their project is habitability, which is habitability of life. So people are saying, we are committing planeticide, planeticide are saying, we will leave the planet less habitable by life. So now on to the, my last pages then. Um, Okay, the last few pages. <clears throat> the Anthropocene, as the geographer Nigel Clark puts it, confronts the political, therefore, with forces and events that have the capacity to undo the political. Now, the whole debate about Anthropocene is, uh, is really on this cusp. Because people like the French two authors who written this book called The Shock of the Anthropocene, uh, Fresson and Bonnet, they actually argue that Yes, there may be geological time involved, but we can't intervene politically in geological time. So to think of geology is to anesthetize politics. Or Andreas Mam and Hornborg, the Swedish scholars, say it paralyzes politics. And what I'm saying is that when, in order to keep politics alive, you, could, you translate from Earth history to world history. You translate the geophysical, the physical, concept of physical force into power. Uh, the socio So Nigel Clark is one of the few social, social, social scientists saying that let's then face it. Anthropocene is actually a critique of the political. It's showing the limits of being political. So he says, it confronts the political with forces and events that have the capacity to undo the political. And he invites humanists to embrace the fully inhuman in their thoughts putting them in sustained contact with times and spaces that radically exceed any conceivable human presence. The Anthropocene, in one telling, is a story about humans, but it is also in another telling, a story of which humans are only parts, even small parts, and not always in charge. How to inhabit this second Anthropocene so as to bring the geological into human modes of dwelling are questions that remain. So I'm kind of trying to do a Heideggerian exercise not letting the question of being just reveal and hide itself. So not letting the geological just come into our thoughts flittingly and then escape us. How do we actually dwell it at that moment when the geological stares us in the face through words like excessive CO2, renewable, non-renewable, these everyday words. It could indeed take decades, even centuries, writes Dasanov to accommodate to a revolutionary reframing of human nature relationships. So one obstacle to contemplating such accommodation is of course the attachment in much contemporary thought to a very particular construction of what we call the political. This attachment functions as a fearful and anxious injunction against thinking the geobiological lest we should end up anesthetizing or paralyzing the political itself. So I'm actually saying it's almost a neurotic anxiety. One could read it as a symptom, this attachment. Um, um, and therefore, one could say that being political could also be a form of denial, in, in part, of the, of the predicament. The task, it has seemed to me for, for some time, is not to give up on the political and our demand for justice between the more powerful and the less powerful, 
but to resituate it within the awareness of a predicament that not now marks the human condition. The predicament is that we have to bring within the grasp of the effective structures of human historical time, the vast scales of the times of geobiology that these structures do not usually engage. Our evolution did not prepare us for this task. I'm just currently reading a wonderful book by a German guy called Peter Wohlleben, uh, The Hidden Life of Trees. Uh, Tim Flannery's written a nice forward to it. And if you read the first page, you, you suddenly, it makes you sit up that he says, you know, trees can live for 800 years. But for the timber industry, 100 years is a mature tree. <laughs> and you fell them at 100 years. Um, so normally, that's, that's how normally deep history comes to us. We kind of acknowledge it and then not acknowledge it. So what does it mean to dwell, to be political, to pursue justice, when we live out the everyday with the awareness that what seems slow in human and world historical terms may indeed be instantaneous on the scale of Earth history? I cannot fully or even satisfactorily answer the question yet, but surely we cannot even begin to answer it if the political keeps acting as an anxious prohibition on thinking of that which leaves us feeling outscaled. Our sense of the planet has been profoundly based on what Edmund, Edmund Husserl once famously called the ontic certainty of the world that human beings enjoyed. The world is pre-given to us, he wrote, the waking, always somehow practically interested subjects. To live is to always live in certainty of the world. Waking life is being awake to the world and of oneself as, as living in the world, actually experiencing their Leben and actually affecting the ontic certainty of the world. So he would repeat this point in the origin of geometry and he would go on to say, the world we actually inhabit every day, what he calls ontic certainty with what I would call a Holocene assumption, Husserl said, this world doesn't move. And it is because this world doesn't move that I know that I can go out of my home and walk to the telescope in my astronomy department and find the department to be there. That I actually then can, through the telescope, look at the planet, other planets, and know that the world actually moves. But the fact that the world actually moves doesn't impact, has, has no impact on my everyday certainty of the no, non-moving world that I inhabit. So he's saying it's because the world doesn't move that I can now talk about. So he's saying that when I inhabit the world, other planets don't come into view. Just as deep history doesn't come into view when I inhabit the world in the Holocene mode. But if I inhabit the world in the Anthropocene mode, deep history then comes into view because, it's part, because geology beckons at us through those everyday words like renewable, non-renewable, uh, excess CO2 and all that. So, to, um, <clears throat> so, just to quote a little bit of Husserl on this, this earth, Husserl asserts, cannot move. He says, it is on this earth, it is on the earth, toward the earth, starting from it, and still on it, that motion occurs. The earth itself, in conformity to the original idea of it, does not move, nor is it at rest. It is in relation to the earth that motions and rest first have sense. So it is not at rest either, because... Motion is the opposite of rest. He says the duality can only make sense only in my ontic certainty of the world I inhabit. Climate change challenges this ontic certainty of the earth that humans have enjoyed through the Holocene epoch and perhaps for longer. Our everyday thoughts have here have begun to be oriented thanks again to the current dissemination of geological terms such as the Anthropocene in public culture by the geological fact that the earth that Husserl took for granted as the stable and unshakable ground from which all human thoughts, even Copernican ones, arose, actually has always been a fitful and restless entity in its long journey through the depths of geological time. It is not that we have not known of catastrophes in geological history of the planet. We have. But the knowledge did not affect our quotidian sense of an innate assurance that the earth provides a stable ground on which we project our political purposes. The Anthropocene disturbs that certainty by bringing the geological into the everyday. Nigel Clark makes this observation one of the starting points for his fascinating book, In Human Nature, by noticing how scientific facts can never entirely displace the visceral trust, I'm quoting him, in Earth, sky, life, and water, 
that humans come to possess. And yet see how all four of Clark's terms are under question today. We do not know if the Earth or Earth system will honor our trust as we warm her up by emitting greenhouse gases into the sky, if fresh water will run short, if life, as some predict, will be threatened with a great extinction. And here I must say, you know, so when we don't look at the geological and we only look at world history and find this whole question of what can we do about it and can we fix it, can we fend it off, can we manage it, geoengineering, stewardship of the planet, and the story that human beings can endlessly extend their sovereignty, which you find in philosophers like Martha Nussbaum, uh, Spheres of Justice, and uh, many liberal thinkers actually would also say this. It always reminds me of a chapter in Kant's Contest of Faculties, uh, where Kant tells a nice joke about a doctor, 18th century, obviously German doctor, whose habit was always to uh, encourage his patients to think that they were improving. Talking about optimism. Uh, and this is in the chapter where uh, Kant says, "Will humans can, are humans capable of continuous improvement? And then one day a patient walks into his surgery and the doctor says, how are you doing, my friend? And the patient says, I'm obviously dying of continuous improvement. <laughs> and, and having said this, Kant actually spells out four conditions uh, under which uh, maybe humans uh, will improve. And one of those conditions for him is providence. He says wisdom from above. And maybe as the crisis gets deeper, we will get wisdom from not from above, but unfortunately on the earth through disasters and, and suffering. Um, the other thing is that he says if humans have an immeasurable amount of time available to them. Thirdly, he says it from memory, uh, if humans are not replaced by another species. Uh, so here's uh, the fourth one I forget. But, but, but this, these questions become relevant again uh, as we, as I say, as the geological faces us, in the, the, the really uh, confronts us. Wittgenstein once said, we see men building and demolishing houses and are led to ask, how long has this house been there? And then he says, but how does one come on the idea of asking that about a mountain, for example? And his assumption is that humans will never ask how long the mountain's been there. And that is what I'm calling the Holocene assumption. So in this book on, called Uncertainty, where he's arguing with G. E. Moore, he says, he asks this question, so we ask the age of a house, how old, was, how old was it before it was demolished? But we don't ask this of mountains. But now we do. You read the literature on climate change, age of mountains, age of seas, all those things are actually at issue. Perhaps then history provides the answer to Wittgenstein's question. A time has come when for humanists contemplating the Anthropocene, questions about histories of volcanoes, mountains, oceans, and plate tectonics of the planet in short have become as routine in the life of critical thought as questions about capital and its necessary inequities. Thank you.